Yes, hi everyone. Um, thanks for uh, having me here, <clears throat> um, Professor Johnson and everyone else present at the conference. Um, I changed my uh, title a little bit because um, I also want to discuss about some of the nanophotonic devices that we have been working on. And I just noticed that there's a small typo in my diffractive structures. Um, I didn't notice that before, so I hope you excuse me for that. Um, before beginning, I want to point out that um, <clears throat> currently I am a research assistant professor at the University of Utah, and I work in close collaboration with Professor Rajesh Menon. And we are, um, can you guys see, uh, like I changed from the slides over to our website. Okay, sorry, I just saw the chat. Okay, so yeah, so I, as I was saying, so I, I obtained my PhD at the University of Utah and the, Professor Menon was my advisor and I completed my postdoc <clears throat> and currently I am research assistant professor. Excuse me for my throat because I recently had COVID, but I'm doing pretty good right now. Um, but my throat's kind of still a little bit sore. And these are some of the PhD students who are working in our group. And most of the work that I'm going to describe today is from our research group, the Menon group at the University of Utah. So having said that, let me go back to my presentation. So um, one thing to note is that uh, primarily we are a very uh, experimental group. Um, and the way we use electromagnetic sol solvers or softwares like MEEP is primarily either in simulating some of the designs that ultimately we are going to make or fabricate or verifying some of the designs. So most of the work that I'm going to show today are actually, well, I have a lot of like simulated results, but I also have a lot of experimental results. Um, as contribution goes um, um, with respect to, uh, from the developer point of view, I don't think we have um, a lot to offer here, but I hope that some of the ways by which we have used MEEP in our um, research over the past few years will be of interest to everyone over here. So there's two kinds of devices that I'm going to discuss today. Um, one of those is the ultra compact nanophotonic devices, and the other one are our free space diffractive structures that we use for creating different kind of imaging devices like flat lenses, holograms, and so on. So going uh, going forward, let me start off with the ultra compact nanophotonic devices first. And this is a work which we have been doing for almost like um, five, six years now. So our motivation behind this work was that we want to um, decrease the footprint of photonic integrated circuits and devices that go into photonic integrated circuits. So behind the concept of, uh, behind the idea was this motivation and how we approached this problem is by looking at it in the form of like a black box. So what we want to do is instead of going with um, traditional design methodologies, we want to say that, okay, I have a waveguide, like a single mode waveguide, which has some kind of predefined input signal. So this is looking at it in a very, very general sense. And I want some kind of a device over here, which, which gives me, a desired output signal. So what I have over here in this like black box is a region of space over which I can engineer the refractive index distribution. And by that, I mean that if the entire device is suppose made in silicon, then silicon can be etched to expose air. So this region can be either formed of regions of air or pockets of air or pillars of silicon, something like that. Now, those kind of structures can be um, like analog structures with different kinds of bends and wavy structures as determined by the um, electromagnetic solver outputs when it optimizes the design. But therein lies a challenge of fabrication because it might not be very easy to mass produce those kind of structures. You would 
essentially need like to have to e-beam each of those structures. So what we chose consciously in order to make fabrications life a lot easier is that we want to discretize this region of space into a checkerboard type pattern. So from the beginning, we are giving a, a constraint on the fabrication that we want only silicon pillars, which are shaped in the form of a square, that's cube pillars, and with a certain side length of say 100 nanometers or something which can be more or less easily fabricated. Now, this is kind of a checkerboard pattern and imagine we can move around, move these silicon pillars around and um, optimize the layout of these pillars and the white regions is the air pockets. So the air pixels and the silicon pixels and find, <clears throat> uh, and find a distribution of these which gives me my desired output signal when the incoming wave interacts with this structure. So that's the basic goal of this. And in order to do that, we couple uh, an electromagnetic solver like me, which is very adept at handling these kind of problems with a very, very simple direct binary search approach. So we just run a bunch of iterations. In each iteration, we look at the position of one of the pixels and change its state. So first, um, let me just go through the algorithm. So we pick a random design and we start an iteration. We pick one of the pixels and we change its state from silicon to air or air to silicon. Then run the electromagnetic simulations and see if our figure of merit has improved. What do I call the figure of merit? Now the figure of merit can be whatever my output as is desired. So suppose I want to do power splitting. So I want to see if the two arms have relatively close to 50-50 power and the insertion loss is low. Maybe I want to do beam splitting based on polarization. Then I want to ensure low insertion loss for each kind of polarization state that couples out, something like that. So the FOM can be uh, defined based on what kind of device I'm trying to optimize for. If the new state of the pixel um, gives an improved figure of merit, then I retain the pixel state. If not, then I revert it back to what it was. And when all the pixels have been completed, that's one of the iterations. And uh, then we start another iteration and so on. Now, once all the iterations are completed, we get an optimized result. Now, this kind of an approach can be improved further using different other kinds of optimizers, which are much more efficient at handling uh, these kind of problems, which require less number of iterations, and less memory and so on. But this is something which was easy for us to set up at that point of time. So most of the results that I have for today come from this. Although later on, we have also shown that you can use many different types of optimizers. We have coupled this with machine learning approaches and all of them work. But I'm showing this just for the sake that the following results were all achieved using something as simple and brute sort of like a brute force approach as a direct binary search. <clears throat> so the idea is that it can always get more sophisticated. And so where MEEP factors in is that each time we run the electromagnetic simulations, we, we use the guided mode simulation thing. So here's one of the examples of the devices that we uh, demonstrated. It's a polarization beam splitter. So imagine on the left-hand side single mode waveguide, you have two polarization states coming in, TE and TM. Um, the idea behind this device is that the TM mode will couple to the top waveguide and the TE mode will couple to the bottom waveguide. In this case, the um, fabrication was on very standard silicon on insulator uh, platform. And just one second. Um, okay, so yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so on silicon on insulator platform and the pixel on the square pixels are like 120 nanometers in a side length and 300 nanometers in depth. So this is our MEEP simulations for the structures after completion of the optimization. So we can see that when there is TM mode, the TM mode couples to the top waveguide. And when there is TE mode, the TE mode couples to the bottom waveguide. Now, during each step of the optimization, this kind of a simulation is run in MEEP, and the output uh, is stored 
as the figure of merit for comparison during the running of the optimization. So this is like what the structure looks like once the optimization is complete. After that, in order to verify um, the simulations with experiments, we completed fabrication of this. Here we can see that the device has been fabricated in silicon on silicon dioxide platform. And in this case, we chose a focused ion beam milling to create these tiny structures. And during characterization, um, what we did was we edge coupled the light source. Um, and this is designed for a 1.55 micron wavelength. So I should have mentioned that before. Uh, so we uh, edge couple the light source and the output. And what we do is we see that this kind of a device also has sort of a broadband performance. And the curves, like the transmission curves for the TE and the TM mode in each of the coupling outputs match pretty closely with the simulations which are shown in the dotted line. Again, for calculating these kind of bandwidths, MEEP is very useful because it's almost like a one-step process. And we truly just follow like the tutorials that are there in MEEP to set up these kind of structures. We see that this kind of a device also gives pretty good extinction ratio, like the cross coupling between the two waveguides for each of the polarization states is pretty low. So this is like around 10 dB and the transmission is around 70%. And of course, you can imagine that if these kind of structures, since they are discretized, if they were more like analog structures, maybe the efficiencies in this case would improve even further. But those kind of structures might have some difficulty when they are being fabricated. So for the time being, uh, because we also want to quickly demonstrate these devices experimentally, we chose this kind of a fabrication constraint. This is another example of a device that we have um, demonstrated. This shows metamaterial cloaking for um, placing two waveguides side by side and such that they don't cross couple. So here we see on the simulation that is running right now, again, a MEEP simulation is that this is very simple. Two waveguides are placed close to each other. And for both TE and TM case, um, these, when, when one of the waveguides has light passing, the light couples to the closely spaced waveguide on top. So the light is, um, supposed to be confined in the bottom, but we know that it will couple to the top waveguide. So here we show that if we introduce some kind of an optimized structure in the gap between these two waveguides, then we can prevent this kind of a cross coupling between the two waveguides. You can see that um, compared to the reference where there is strong cross coupling between the two waveguides, at the right hand side over here, we can see that almost no light has coupled from the bottom waveguide to the top waveguide. Again, this kind of a simulation and op this kind of an optimization was done following the same procedure that I discussed. And the beauty of that is that you can keep the overall framework of the, of the optimization of the algorithm similar but you can change the figure of merit. You can change whatever desired structures you want to optimize. And you can very easily couple that with me to generate um, simulations at each step. One thing to note is that um, because this takes quite a lot of iterations and um, some memory challenges might be there, uh, for these kind of devices, we actually used Amazon Web Services and MEEP was available there, so it made our life a lot easier to uh, manage all the resources that are required for these kind of simulations. Um, here we show that uh, sim this simulation shows that, um, well, for a micro ring resonator, we want the light to couple through the resonator, right? But this, for the sake of the paper, we sh wanted to show an example that oh, suppose we don't, we show that our device works by basically shielding the micro ring resonator. So over here, you can see that the device can be placed on one side, but the um, light coming in from either side of the ring resonator will prevent the coupling of the light to the other waveguide, which is on the output side. So this is another demonstration of 
how this device can be used. I mean, no one's going to use it like, but it's just for the sake of proving our point. So after that, um, we took the first case where there's just two waveguides placed close to each other. And the spacing between them remarkably was uh, half a micron. So this is very much within the regime for cross coupling. But we faithfully, we tried as best as we could to faithfully reproduce the simulated and optimized designs to experimental devices. Again, we used FIB for fabricating these devices and we showed that we measured, we um, coupled light into one of the ports and measured the other ports. And we found that the extinction ratio was pretty good and um, it matches pretty well with the simulations. There was maybe a little bit difference, but overall the um, extinction ratio between the port which is carrying the light and the one which we are shielding was um, quite a lot and sufficient so that we could call this kind of a closely spaced devices essentially cloaked. So this gives us an opportunity to think about uh, trying to place devices in closely packed photonic integrated circuits and um, increase integration density for overall circuits. And there are um, a bunch of other um, devices that we have also been working on. So uh, for the sake of time, I have some of them placed in like backup slides, but here we can show that um, since I think I'm doing okay on time, um, we showed that we could also couple um, meet with um, some kind of machine learning approaches where we can use training and inference phases. And this is a very basic type of machine learning approach. And we could also de design other kinds of devices such as like, in this case, we made like very tiny one micron, one micron, 1.2 micron square um, power splitters, uh, 90 degree bends, 180 degree bends and so on. So um, these kind of devices, instead of using the direct binary search approach, we coupled meet with uh, machine learning approaches. And um, we also validated some of the results in Lumerical and the match was pretty clear. Uh, in this case, we did not experimentally verify these devices because the, um, the motivation for this paper was sort of proving that, okay, we could use um, some kind of a machine learning approach to optimize these devices. So it is pretty clear that the optimization approach can be whatever and as much sophisticated as we want it to be. And um, there has also been many other demonstrations of these kind of devices by other groups around the world. And, um, and so we, it gives us some kind of a, um, an outlook for the future that maybe these kind of devices can help to um, achieve greater device integration for photonic integrated circuits. So in this case, like we used MEEP directly during the um, design phase for my um, next type of devices, actually, although we have used some, in some cases, uh, MEEP for um, doing some parts of the design, we mostly use it for doing some verification in this case. So in this next half of my talk, I'm going to um, discuss about some of the diff diffractive structures that we uh, have designed. And mostly the purpose of them is for doing different kinds of imaging. So, and there actually are quite a, quite a lot of other um, places that we have used MEEP, like there's a project related to hyperspectral imaging, some, um, and quite a lot of stuff, but I've mainly chosen to focus on the two main projects. So the first one was the nanophotonic devices. This one is sort of like a free space application. So challenges in imaging. We know that imaging is everywhere these days, right? From cameras, mobile phones, video cameras, microscopes, um, military gear, AR, VR headsets, photography, it's everywhere. So it's, it's definitely one of the most essential things uh, for our lives, but what are the problems? Most of the optics tend to be pretty huge, thick and heavy. Um, it's difficult to manufacture because lenses need to be polished. Um, and usually that's what contributes a lot to the ex ex expense 
of the lenses, especially if you want them to be for some kind of um, very precise um, optical instruments. Um, there's limitations in bandwidths. You have to correct for chromatic aberrations and geometric aberrations and so on. So in, this is one of the solutions that we have demonstrated to the field of free space imaging. That is the concept of a flat lens. So simply put, what is a flat lens? Now, without going into all the different kinds of, oh, is this um, sub-wavelength diffractive structures is not. A flat lens is something which ideally would replace a traditional lens, which is made up of a bulk of glass and curved structures, which are used to bend the light um, to create the image of the object. And we replace that simply with a fat, flat piece of glass and it, which, uh, or a fat, flat piece, piece of some kind of a material. I wouldn't necessarily say glass because we have demonstrated these kind of lenses in a variety of different materials. Um, a flat plane uh, with some kind of nanostructures and the thickness being a few microns, which can achieve similar effect in terms of imaging quality. So flat lenses offer drastic reductions in weight, thickness, and complexity. And um, just for um, the sake we, of uh, being precise, we call our lenses multi-level diffractive lenses. So because most of the, uh, um, like uh, in all cases almost, the structures that, are, uh, that make up these kind of lenses are um, not sub-wavelengths. So these are diffractive structures. And that's why, and they have different height levels. So that's why we call them multi-level diffractive lenses or MDLs for short. So most of the time I'll be either referring to these as MDLs or flat lenses. So over here, you can see that we are holding one of the lenses here. And essentially the lens is made on this glass substrate. So and so thin, you cannot see it in the cross-sectional profile. And um, most of these have very, very low weight and thickness down to a few micro. So that's one of the advantages that these kind of lens offer us. Um, in the previous case, I began with the design and optimization and experiments. But in this case, I decided to maybe present some of the experiments first to get us a little bit excited and then talk about the design. So over here, we see one of the flat lenses um, assembled with a sensor for a camera that we have made. This is some of the imaging that we have um, shown. So this is imaging in sunlight outside with some Legos. Um, this is near IR and this is thermal imaging. So this is actually um, heated coil in front of a heat gun. So we show that our lenses can image across all different kinds of um, wavelengths, all the way from visible to thermal radiation. Um, and Overall, we have demonstrated MDLs across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So from, like I said, from the visible near IR, SWIR, and then long wave, and also in the terahertz regime. So, uh, and we have demonstrated MDLs of varying sizes from some which are like a millimeter up till, um, I have since one of the advantages I have sitting in my lab is that at the end, I can show you some of the bigger lenses that we have uh, designed. We have achieved high numerical apertures, as high as 0 0.9. And this is operating at a single wavelength of 850 nanometers. This is, some of, this is uh, something that was um, almost thought to be very, very difficult to design. And this is 4.13 uh, millimeters in diameter. And this is an optical interferometric measurement of the topography of the lenses with all the different kinds of structures shown here. And this is the point spread function that this kind of a lens produces. And this is something else that we have uh, demonstrated, which we call extreme achromaticity. So by extreme achromaticity, we mean that we can use only one lens and um, image all the way from 450 nanometers, which is blue, to 15 microns, which is long wave IR. So this is keeping in mind only one lens. And during the design, we um, chose the refractive index of diamond, but 
for the sake of fabrication we split two into two substrates like glass and silicon to help us in fabrication but essentially this can be done in one substrate so the simulation shows that um, the, these, are, these are the simulated point spread functions and the measured point spread functions are in the bottom rows. So the top is simulated, the bottom is measured, and also here and here. And what we see is that all the way from 450, 450 nanometers to 11 microns, um, this kind of a structured optimized lens can form point spread function at the desired focal length. So uh, chromatic aberration comes from the fact that wavelengths are difficult to focus at one plane by a single lens. But over here, we are showing that this entire range can be um, chromatically corrected. So extreme achromaticity is what we call this. And this allows us to image using a single lens all different kinds of wavelengths. So this is color images for the visible from 450 nanometers to 850 nanometers. And this is near infrared, 850 nanometers to 950 uh, nanometers. Then short wave to long wave IR, one micron to 14 microns. These are images. This is long wave IR, eight to 12 microns. So um, thermal image. So we demonstrate that using just one lens, you can um, capture images at all different kinds of wavelengths. And the images, the imaging quality does not suffer too much. So what, what, what are the applications? So one of the things that come to mind is like um, in one of the first slides, I showed these kind of tactical gears that um, armies use to, and they have different kinds of cameras and lenses that are integrated to give you both visual and also some kind of feedback in other wavelengths if you're looking at like camouflages and stuff like that. So one thing is we don't need multiple cameras. All we need is one of the lenses that I just demonstrated, which can image from the visible to the long wave IR, and only a dichroic mirror to pick off like two sets of wavelengths. So suppose you have our lens and a dichroic mirror, and it splits the, uh, the light into an LWIR sensor and a visible sensor. And you can get images both invisible and LWIR with the same lens. And you simply combine, and so this is like an illustration. We haven't actually uh, combined or done this post-processing, but I just basically picked up like these images, and I'm showing you like an idea of what uh, we can do in the future. Like we can um, give a vis complete visual um, sense, a visual scene, and also say, oh, look, this part is hot, hot regions. Um, the top of the soldering iron is hot, the heat lamp is hot, something like that. So, and this can be all very, very compact because you don't need to have multiple uh, lenses and cameras. And the lens itself is a flat lens. Um, here's another um, demonstration that we have done, extreme depth of focus. So conventionally, we know that a lens um, sort of focuses around its depth of focus and then the light diverges. What we have shown over here is by carefully optimizing the structures on this lens, uh, we can extend the depth of focus to more than a meter. So this sort of like forms like a pencil of light or a needle uh, of light that propagates away from the lens. And this is the uh, optical microscope image of the lens. And we show that there is diffraction limited focusing from five millimeters to 1200 millimeters. Um, and this shows that um, if we place objects, so suppose that over here on the right hand side, this is our camera with the lens and the sensor. And we have placed objects like a Lego toy, a Macbeth chart, a car. And this is, these are two graduate students. At that time, I think I was a student or a postdoc. Um, so that's me <laughs> and we are holding up some science and all. So almost everything can be photographed and kept pretty much in good focus. So this is the toy, this is the Macbeth chart and the car and so on. And nothing gets blurred because this is like an extreme depth of focus. Lens. But I think this is not a great example because you can do this with a very uh, high F number uh, regular lens. But uh, this is sort of like a better uh, experimental demonstration of the fact that what we are trying to get is like a needle of light that propagates away from the lens. Anyways, so now that I've given some of the um, results first, 
um, let's talk about how we are using, uh, how we are designing these kind of devices and um, how me uh, has helped us. So the, what one, one of the points that I would like to make clear is that flat lens working principle is sort of, isn't very new. And it has been around since the early 1800s when Fresnel lenses were first proposed that essentially um, discard a lot of the bulk of the lens that is usually there for conventional lenses. And you can get something, a Fresnel lens is considered flat if you uh, compare it with a um, regular lens. Of course, in our case, our lenses are much, much thinner than Fresnel lenses. But this, is, this has basically been the idea that uh, what you are looking for essentially is some kind of a, a, a surface over here. Suppose you have plane waveforms coming in. You are looking for a surface that essentially converts the incident plane waves to converging spherical waves that focus at a point. Now, this can be um, any kind of structure as long as it achieves this kind of a of a of an effect. You are going to be able to. Um, do imaging and all sorts of other devices that are lenses supposed to. So basically, it's the same technology which has been rebranded over the years in many uh, different names like zone plates, binary optics, metamaterial lenses, and uh, diffractive lenses, and so on. The only difference being the size of the structures that can be used to differentiate between these like, are they diffractive structures, are they sub wavelength diffractive structures, and so on. So like very um, quickly, we can think of a hyperbolic function. If imparted by a surface over here, it would convert a monochromatic wave into a focusing wave. Now, our insight to this development is what we are saying is that the phase function of an ideal lens, which can do focusing, is, doesn't have to be unique. So in most cases, only intensity is important because you would either have um, your sensor placed over here, or say your retina is same as a sensor that collects the light coming in and gathers the information from that. So at that case, it's converted to intensity. And so we can use the phase at the focal plane as a free parameter. So what we are trying to say is that there's lots of phase functions which can operate as a lens, and it is not unique. And we can choose the phase function based on the type of function we want the lens to be doing. Suppose we want it to achieve achromaticity. Suppose we want it to correct for certain aberrations. Suppose we want extended depth of field, something like that. Based on that, we can choose the phase functions. And here is something that I'll demonstrate is that, so this is the lens phase function, right? So which means this is the pupil function, the phase function at the plane of the lens. So over here, after doing some optimization of an achromatic lens, what we are seeing is that this is the lens phase function for blue light, 500 nanometers. And this is at the focus. So at the focus, this is the intensity, which is the cross section of the point spread function. This is the amplitude and this is the phase. Now, what we are seeing is that for the same surface, this are the, these are the lens phase functions for the same surface at the pupil plane, blue light, green light, red light, and IR. And at the focal plane, these all have sort of varying phase functions. But at the end of the day, when you're squaring the field and getting the intensity, you can see from the cross section of the point spread function that for all of these different colors of light, the light has been focused at the same plane. So this is what we are saying as that the phase function of an ideal lens doesn't necessarily have to be unique. And if we can exploit that, we can make a lens perform many different functions, correct many kinds of aberrations and so on. So again, different kinds of phase functions from the same surface for different wavelengths at the pupil plane produce focused spots at the focal plane. And that is sort of what allows us to design an, a, a, a super achromatic lens like this one, which can focus light from all the way from blue to um, all the way to IR. Now, of course, there might be uh, somewhat, you might be already thinking that is there a trade off between like the numerical aperture that can be um, achieved 
um, versus the bandwidth that it can correct over? Yes, there is. And that is something that we are exploring at the moment. In this case, this was a fairly low numerical aperture lens, but we can still show that for a fairly, fairly moderate numerical aperture, chromatic aberrations can still be correct. And then there are some questions that can arise for, okay, like how good is the strain ratio, how good is the imaging and so on. But, um, and that's something that we are looking into, but this sort of gives us a, like a proof of principle of the idea that we are presenting. Now I come to the fact where um, we are doing the designs is very similar to the approach that I discussed for the nanophotonic devices. And we do inverse design using binary search. In this case, what we do is our lenses are composed of these rings, as you can see. And these rings are uh, of a certain width, but different heights. So these height levels are determined by the grayscale lithography process that we use to etch different depths. And our optimization process basically changes the depth of these to get the best uh, figure of merit. And, and then we can achieve convergence to the optimal design. During the, uh, during the optimization, we have used me, but the problem is nowadays we are trying to make like larger lenses. So in that case, uh, it is a little bit difficult to use me to design large structures like this. But over here, we show that we have done some device verification using me. For the large structures, what we do is we use scalar diffraction theory. Now, scalar diffraction theory is not very trustworthy when the numerical aperture becomes very high. So in those cases, we make smaller scaled down versions of the lenses. And for high numerical apertures, like say 0 0.81 and so on, uh, we use MEEP to double check the results with scalar diffraction theory. Like in this case, in this paper, what we are presenting is uh, a broadband high numerical aperture lens at diff three different wavelengths. And we want to study what the off axis PSFs look like, like oblique, and axis, oblique incidence PSFs. So um, over here, this is five degrees, 13, 27, 40 degrees. And these are some of the simulation results from me. In this case, we used me because we can trust because it uses FTD, we can trust it more than scalar diffraction theory when it comes to high numerical apertures. And this gave us a pretty good insight as to what should be like the operating uh, field of view for this lens. So <clears throat> these are, and most of the simulations in this, like in the previous one, I could show like a full animation of uh, light being guided through it. Right? In this case, most of the simulations look like these point spread functions at the focal plane. And so in this case, it's more, it's better, I guess, to show some of the experiments that I showed. A quick word on the fabrication. Uh, all of these are fabricated at the Utah Nanofab using grayscale lithography. Um, I am assuming you are familiar with this. Right. So the, for the interest of time, I'm skipping ahead. Um, this is a scanning electron microscope of a fabricated long wave IR lens on silicon. And this is how it is being used, coupled with a FLIR um, long wave IR sensor to create a flat thermal camera. So this is a soldering iron and the tip is very hot, so on. And um, there's, um, let's see, um, I think I'm almost out of time. So there's a bunch of other things that we have also been working on. These are some diffractive holograms. Basically, the idea is the same. So I'm just going to go over quickly, show some experiments. So basically, this is like a hologram which um, shows uh, like a rainbow-shaped heart in sunlight. And then when you put like an IR filter, you can see like a small lion. So this is a multiplexed hologram. The structures are basically the same as the lenses. But you can see in visible light, it creates a rainbow-shaped pattern. And in IR, it creates a a lion in the focal plane. And most of the optimization is done in the same manner as the lenses, just that in the place of defining a figure of merit as a focused spot, over here we define it as an image. Okay, so there's a bunch of other things as well we are doing with um, um, micro lens arrays and so on, but I think I'm almost out of time. 
So uh, I would like to take, um, let me see. Uh, I just wanted to show, since I am in the lab, these are, this is like one of the first kinds of lenses that we did. And you can see it's this tiny dot at the center. Over here, that's the lens. Then we sort of scaled up and these are some of the bigger lenses that we did. This is like a grade up lenses that we have all flat lenses. And finally, um, we have even scaled up <coughs> to something which is like this big. So this entire thing is a flat lens. And this is one of the papers that I'm working on right now. So this is like a four inch uh, flat lens, which can be used for um, telescopes and stuff like that. So that's basically eventually the goal to make these devices bigger but thinner. So they're lightweight and can be integrated in different places. And um, let me go back quickly to end the talk. So yeah, so finally, I would just like to thank um, my advisor, Professor Menon, uh, Professor Rodriguez, who I collaborate with, uh, Professor uh, Fernando Guevara Vasquez, and um, all the different uh, PhD students in our lab who are currently there and in the past who have helped us bring all of these kind of experiments to success. And um, of course, to the entire MEEP team, Professor Johnson for having me here, and Ardaman, he has always been a lot of good support for a lot of questions that we have had um, when we are doing different kinds of things in MEEP. So yeah, thanks a lot. I hope you liked the talk and I'm free to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, so. Uh, just a reminder, people online, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. There's a Q&A button on Zoom. Uh, but meanwhile, does anyone have any, uh, any questions? Uh, Ardivan? Okay, I see that there's one question which asks, how is the binary, uh, direct binary search done with the multi-level diffractive structures? So the idea is basically the same. So in the case of the silicon nanophotonic devices, what we were doing is that we were toggling the state of the um, pixel, like whether it's silicon or air, and then we were checking the figure of merit to see if it has improved. In this case, I might have gone through this a little bit quickly. So in this case, what we have are these rings, right? So if we can see over here, these rings have different heights, but a defined width. Now, what we do in the direct binary search is that in that case, what we did was we toggled the state of the pixels. Over here, we are changing the height of the rings. Now, what the range of the height we can achieve is di directly determined by the grayscale lithography process. So in grayscale lithography, um, what we can achieve is that given a layer of photoresist, we can modulate the dose delivered to the resist, like shown over here, to make different kinds of heights, height structures. So if we know that, okay, we can achieve 64 different heights or 64 different gray levels with our fabrication process, that's what we tell the algorithm. Like, okay, your minimum height is zero where the entire ring will be exposed and developed and your maximum height is a 64th level above zero for a maximum height of usually in our case, it's like 2.4 microns. So you basically divide the 2.4 micron into 64 different steps. So you have 64 different heights, which you can toggle during the direct binary search optimization. So in the, that case, you were toggling the refractive index of the square pixel. Over here, you're toggling the height of the ring. And in each case, you're running the simulations, checking the figure of merit, going back and doing the same thing. Upper team, uh, two questions for you. One um, uh, related, both of them related to the, uh, the flat lens with the super uh, achromatic property. When you showed an image of the optimal design, it seemed that most of the features were on the outer boundary, right? Why is that? It seems to be there's almost featureless in the interior, um, whereas all the design is on the outer boundaries. And then second question, 
these structures, uh, you may be aware, you can simulate this in cylindrical coordinates in MEEP. So that's actually a 2D simulation, right? So in principle, you could scale that up to be millimeters in size. It's a 2D simulation. You could parallelize it. Um, um, in fact, it's a tutorial that I prepared uh, at the request of Rajesh Manon to simulate a binary phase zone plate, which was, uh, I guess, intended for these kinds of applications. So I'm wondering whether you've actually tried that, tried to set this up as a cylindrical coordinate simulation um, rather than a 3D, which would obviously be uh, quite large. Yes. So let me answer your second question first, because yes, that is true. And that's something that we are working on right now. And most of the stuff related to setting, using that kind of a simulation, that's actually being handled by Professor Menon right now. So right now, I don't have any results from those devices yet that are using that kind of an optimization. But I am aware of the fact that, yes, we are using them. So all the results that I have right now are from previously what we were doing. But yes, you're right. And we, that is something that we are already working on. Um, for the first question, actually, it would have been a little bit better. Uh, I think the, pap the actual paper has the cross-sectional view. So this is not actually featureless. You know, what this looks like is sort of like a, the center part is sort of like a gradient. So all the rings form sort of like a gradient like this. So from the top view, it looks like it's flat. It's actually not flat because these optical microscope images are not that, um, informative. So we have a cross-sectional plot in the paper, but it, it will show that this center part is sort of like this, like a dome shape with the heights in a gradient. And then there's a bunch of different heights at the edges. So one of the questions that we were asked is that, okay, are the features on the side actually doing anything? Or is this very similar to just how a regular lens would work? So we simulated that uh, getting rid of the features on the side and the achromaticity in that case suffers. This is, as far as I remember, this is part of the paper or it was asked in the review, something like that. But yes, um, just to clarify, the center of the lens is not flat or featureless. It is sort of like this, but the variation is low enough that it hasn't been captured in the top down microscope image. But if you look at the paper, I think we did, or in the supplementary, I remember there's the height profile of the cross section. So you can see the structures, but they vary very slowly. So it doesn't show up in this photo. And then there are structures on the outer edges. And we have shown that all of them contribute to the working of the lens. I did have one question on the earlier thing. You were, you were showing uh, uh, optimization by, you trained a machine learning model first, and then you optimize that uh, on the previous section of the talk yeah. before the lens. Uh, yeah, I think I put that in the back. This is, yeah, yeah. Uh, slide 64, I think, yeah, or that, yes, that, yeah. yes. So for, for these, how many, uh, 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 so you're training machine learning model to basically predict the, the output intensity uh, at the, yeah. the, so, as a function of the inputs. So how is, is if you train a machine learning model and predict the output intensity and then minimize that, how, how different is the result from just taking the minimum over the training set? And how big is the training set in this case? Um, in this case, I think the training set was pretty big. I think these were the number of guesses. And what you're saying is pretty much correct. And if I, uh, for the interest of time and the fact that uh, I wasn't actively working on this, I did not describe the machine learning algorithm, but yes, what you're saying is very much correct. So in, in, during the training phase, a reward is attributed to each of the designs. And then we are essentially doing an inference space to calculate what the best case or sort of like an average best case is for all the designs that we went through. So yes, what you're saying is kind of correct, I would say, mm -hmm. that it is almost similar to like taking the minimum. On the uh, on the uh, uh, multi-level lens optimization, have you thought about going to a gradient-based optimization similar to uh, topology optimization, where you do a projection at the end of the multiple levels? 
uh, rather than doing an exhaustive search, which does or not exhaustive, but I mean this kind of discrete search, which might not scale very well, and it might, and it might not even converge. That's the uh, you know I was wondering also, you, do you ever hit a situation where it starts cycling around? That's the danger when you start doing discrete jumps. Uh, um, the, the, I would say that in our case, in most of the lenses that we have um, demonstrated so far, yes, you're right that the the improvement of the figure of merit does taper off. And that is usually where the case, where we sort of like, um, we stop the optimization. Like we are like, okay, this is good enough for the time being. And that does necessarily mean that, is this the best design? No. So, and there can obviously be uh, better approaches like gradient descent and all that to uh, make both the optimization faster and achieve a better optimized result. But um, quite honestly, uh, I think we don't have enough people to work on uh, exploring all these kind of different uh, approaches. Otherwise, yes, this is we have like a list of different things that we have to explore here uh, in all of these projects and um, get either better results or even make our lives easier for designing these type of devices. So yes, we have given a lot of thought, but we haven't uh, been able to have enough time and um, resources to explore that. Mm -hmm.